Turn on. Welcome everybody. Good evening. It's uh, five oh one p.m. and I welcome you all to tonight's meeting of the planning. So first, we'll start with some old business. Um, let's see. All right. So I'll just simply. Uh, Quick debrief on annual town meeting. I think it went well. All of our articles passed. Mm -hmm. There were, um, Very positive. it seemed like it went over well. The one thing that I think, uh, of course, I always think of the right ways to answer all the questions like the next day. Yeah. Um, the one clearly. I hadn't adequately prepared for the sixth on the, the footnote piece. Mm -hmm. And one of your, does the finance committee have any more meetings? No. No more meetings. Uh, I'm new to this. We have one in the fall because when if free cash gets um, certified or something, there's something like uh, a meeting at a special town meeting in the fall, but it's, it's, it's um, more like procedural stuff. So. It's just one of the members, one of the I members, mean, yes, had clearly. I had not satisfied him. He thought his comment was that we were changing the movement. Yes. And so it's, I mean, it passed. So, yep. but it would, if you ever have an opportunity and this is water under the bridge, it's certainly not required, but it, 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 would, be, it would be nice if we understood what was really going on. Okay. Uh, in terms of what's happened, any other comments? So, as part of the finance committee, we've been discussing we need to have more growth in town for a new tax revenue to come in. Uh -huh. Because we have a sixth number of houses, what we can uh, assess each year in taxes, money coming in, and then we have to supplement that with new growth. So we're very much in favor of anything that lets us have new houses and new development come into town. Okay. So it's kind of a bit surprising to hear that coming from Tommy about that, but. That was essentially going to allow a couple of new projects to end the taxpayer swing. Yeah, yeah. And as my land becomes more scarce and it's more difficult to build on the easy plots, we're going to have houses that are more than 400 feet off the road. That's a reality. Yeah. And it's something that financially we can use. Yeah. So I think that'll be. That's good news for Sylvie because that's a good lead into the exit 35 studies. Yeah, yeah. That will be. We need some revenue. Yeah. Okay. Our cost of business keep going up, and from the finance committee, we have people come in from all of the various boards and committees, and their their requests are minimal, and they're faced with um, cost of living increases, cost of business increases. We want to fund these things. Yeah. So we would like to come from somewhere. Yeah. Well, that'll be helpful as we um, think about our future priorities. So we'll move back to that. Yeah. Um, any other comments? About town meeting from anyone who was there, Sarah, Judy. All right. In terms of what's coming up next as a result of follow up actions from town meeting, um, Judy, I see what I recall with respect to the zoning map. What I seem to recall we did last year was we put the new zoning map up with a, as a link from a a new page that basically said this is provisional pending AGO review. Is that consistent with your recollection? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I have a question. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, so Harlan Bean asked me afterwards, like, does this mean we get to start tomorrow? And I my understanding is that um we're now so this relates to let me let me get to that. Okay. Right? Because one of the things that I'm doing now working with Amy LaValley yep. is the uh their form seven that we have to submit to the attorney general's office on all of our bylaw things, providing a bunch yep. of documentation. And then once the form seven is submitted to the attorney general's office by the town clerk. And the town clerk has 30 days to do so after town meeting. Yep. So we're in this period where we got to get form seven together, get it to the attorney general. Yep. Office. I remember. They have 90 days to review what has passed at town meeting. Yep. And they could they could reject some or all of our so Harlan used to wait out that review period of 
board? It's, it's, no, it's conditional. The zoning changes are effective as of the date of the first advertising of, a, of our first public hearing. At that point, they're conditional on passage of town meeting and passage by the attorney general. Um, now they're effective conditional on pass approval by the attorney general, but they are effective. You can't shovel on the ground until- It seems effectively that he could not start a project that depended on these being passed by the attorney I know with my project, it took all of 120 days to get it. We had a town meeting in May and I didn't get approval until the end of October. Yeah. Right, Judy, I mean, what you said is true, but effectively a new project couldn't start reliably- Actually, it can't start reliably, but somebody could start it if they wanted to. They're just taking- Might have to stop. Yeah, yeah they, well, okay, right. right. I build at risk, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, it, but it's, that's- It's how much risk you wanna take, so. Okay. Right. So that's the, the situation. But, but it's not in reality, it could have just been a clerical error mix up. The town's already voted in. Those things have happened. If we yeah. didn't do the, the okay. noticing right, I mean, there could be- Okay. Uh, I think we did everything. Don rolled the eyes, crossed every T. Yep. But um, this can, will be the town clerk too. Yes. So I will just for everyone's edification after we get a form set together on all yeah. six of these, I'll share it so you know what okay. all we had to submit to the attorney general's office. Okay. Um, and the other task is that I do have an updated zoning map from our GIS specialized. Specialist at FERCOG, and I have GIS data. Another contingent thing we need to do is get this zip, the GIS overlay added back to the Access GIS system. That's been held up by the fact that it all went through the assessor's office. Our assessor has resigned, as we learned, or I learned, at town meeting. We haven't been able to hire a new assessor. They did. They hired a new man. It's wonderful. I met him. Since when Fred Olasky spoke up and he said they were going with a consultant? Cynthia retired. Yes. And they hired, we hired a company in the town. We hired a company and he's a, a young man out of Amherst. Okay. He's great. And he, we share him with Conway. Okay. And he has office hours here eight hours a week. Okay. He was great. He was out and with I person training him. What? So we hired him as a, it was, it was cheaper for the town, I guess, or more beneficial for the town to hire a company to do this outsourcing, essentially. Okay. That's how he has office hours here. He came around to the house I'm building. He introduced himself. I was really impressed with him. Awesome. All right. Well, then I can communicate. I've held off communicating with the assessor's office pending yep. all of this. Nope. That's so a job. Out. Okay. So I think that's all I want to do in terms of the debrief on annual town meeting. The uh, selectmen hired him. The contract for okay. him goes through the selection. Sure. Because the assessors are elected board. Yeah. But he's an employee of the town. Okay. So there was a little bit of a cross there. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do, I see that Aaron Smith yeah, he's the neighbor. Is, is the abutter to Seven River Road. As is gonna, Kate McKinnon, that's Chris's wife. Yeah, that's or Chris Green is yeah. here as uh, Kate McKinnon. Yeah. Um, the MCTC is not here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push down to later a discussion at the admin assistance for the board and teach history of news. And I want to get to Seven River Road and then I want to get to State Road. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do, first I'm going to share my screen and provide a little bit of new information. Now, seven different This will also, I think, relate to state records. Okay, what I'm sharing, well, so let me just, before I explain what this plan from Seven River Road that I'm sharing. So um, I've, since our last meeting, we had some opportunity to talk with uh, D. Kane, our new town administrator. Mm -hmm. I'm very impressed by I've Pete. Not met him yet. Brings a lot of great knowledge. We are also- The big um, show from that Yeah, yeah, but he's sharp, knowledgeable. You're talking about the Seven River Road situation and along with um, Deborah Carney and the CPA. And it was made abundantly clear to me that, um, well, in a town meeting on, for a different context, I said 
that uh, my mother often told me that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And what um, I, I'll take, I'll, I take full responsibility for this. At last meeting, you know, we had this conversation with the MCTC, with Tim Smith, with Ethan Hasley and others, of the, the butters. Um, and you might say what I was attempting to do was help mediate or resolve this situation. And I've since learned that this is not at all something that the planning board ought to be doing. It's not within the bounds of our authority. We are not a, we have no legal compliance authority. We don't do investigations. That is all under the auspices of the building inspector. Okay. So I've been kind of gently reminded that um, what we, at most, what we can be doing in this situation is, and of course, whether we as a board do this or any citizen in town can engage the building inspector on any matter if they have any concerns, mm -hmm. full stop. If Ethan Haslett, if Tim Smith, if any of the abutters to say Seven River Road have concerns and they would like the building inspector to perform, uh, uh, do an inspection or make a determination, then that is their prerogative. It's helpful that it, that we're aware of it in case it raises any questions for us. About I got the feeling in the last year they were trying to find consensus. They were. However, it is not the not job of the planning board right. to convene stakeholders as we did and yep. and do this. You know, it's it's nice, you might say, but it's the it is you not know, our job. People don't like his decision. They can appeal to the zoning exactly. board. Exactly. Appeal to the, the, the clerk. So I I. I didn't quite get my wrist slapped, but I was counseled okay. to, you know, stick to the things that the planning board is the is within the purview of the planning board and mediating disputes among. So is it a, if we want to if you wish this is before my time issue an order of conditions with the site plan approval? Is it our responsibility to make sure that those were conditions are followed? Yeah, or is it, the it is the building inspector's so responsibility. It's, it's a non-issue for us right now. It is a non-issue for us. However, what Tim, uh, or not Tim, Pete, uh, Pete Kane, our town administrator said, what we particularly regarding the landscape screening. So I'm sharing all of this, knowing that Tim Smith is on the call, and I will. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to shut people down. But I want people to be informed before we have a discussion about Seven River Road. Sure. You know, what, where I am coming into this. Yep. So, uh, with respect to the land, so what I'm showing you now is the site plan that was approved for Seven River Road, and this plan was dated November 17, 2022. And a couple of things I'll highlight for all of us here and those on the call with regard to landscape screen, and if you can sort of see my mouse, there is a region where landscape screening was in the plan. Yeah. All right. And you'll notice there's a there's the perimeter, the security fencing, and yeah. then there's a bump out that had to be there because of these wetlands. Yeah. And that narrows down that zone between the security fence and the property line. And no screening was proposed there because it's too narrow, yeah. all right? And then there's notation, this arrow, I'll just slide over, see, see existing trees provide visual buffer, sort of like the screening of the fence line in this section was expected to be handled by vegetation already in place. So the key thing to understand is that the planning board approved this plan and any conditions that we set forth in our site plan conditions, right? So we don't have to specify everything in the plan and our conditions because the plan is the plan, all right? So for those like, say, those who have been concerned about landscape screening, all that the planning board approved was screening in this area per this plan. And the plan sets forth that it would be 
buffer trees, you know, 17 trees minimum staggered. If you see this little white box. Yep. Now this white box and its contents are the issue that Tim Smith has because that plan in Tim Smith's judgment yep. would create issues, shading issues with his agricultural land. Correct. All right. So the way we are supposed to deal with this is, the, is not by what I tried to do last time, but rather um, we need, we can ask, we as the planning board can ask the building inspector to make a determination regarding what needs to be done with respect to this landscape screening. And we can provide input. Um, but really what needs yeah. to happen. Hold Do on a I second. remember that there was a subsequent amended plan? This is the amended plan. As, okay. Thank you. Um, so, and our site plan approval conditions specify that it's the plan, that the site plan should be consistent with the plan dated November 17, 2022, which is what I'm showing here. Okay. I, I thought that what I took from the last meeting was that uh, Chris was on. So they were going to try to find uh, something that's going to work that didn't shoot screw to stay up. Absolutely. But the big issue was the parking of the driveway being going across the property. That's what they were trying. Well, there are two. Let's separate okay. those two issues. Let's right now. I want to just focus on the landscape screen. Okay. Because one thing I want to put out into the public sphere here with people like Tim and and I guess Kate. Chris is representing. Kate. Coming in as Kate, I don't know if Tim's on the call. Uh, I mean, Ethan. It was Ethan Hazlitt who had the initially raised the question about landscape screen. Okay. So one thing I just want to make clear that the only the extent of screening that we approved only goes as far as this plan shows up to that bump out in the perimeter. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is curious why there isn't and never may never be, unless they voluntarily add it, and why would they? But there's the only screening is supposed to be in the area shown here on this plan. Yep. Okay. All right. And the problem is that this approved plan is now inconsistent with what we act, we, the abutters, and essentially us, the planning board, we do not want these specific plants that are going to be too high and so forth there. So the way I'm told that this has to happen legally and procedurally is we, the planning board, ask the building inspector, zoning or compliance and enforcement officer, to make a determination and direct that a revised plan that's agreeable, that's all, parties. agreeable to all parties be prepared. We don't have to we don't do have a full to site it. review or anything like that. But we do need to obtain a new site plan. Okay. With respect to screening and the plan things. And we can't just, I mean, we don't have the authority yeah. to ask that this be done. In fact, blah, blah, blah. All right. So there is a procedure yeah. where whereby this is going to take okay. So that's with regard to screening. And I will open the floor in a moment, but now I want to turn to the issue of the driveway. Yeah, they were cutting too close in this driveway okay. and damaging this property. And what I'm yeah. going to try to do... Because they moved the driveway, right? And, but they were still using the old one or something? Or it was a little so I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this plan so you can see again what we approved. There was a discussion at last week's meeting in particular about paving the driveway April which was in fact discussed at that meeting back in 2022 and the parties verbally agreed to it, but that does not have any force, mm -hmm. All right? What's, what has force is what's in this plan and what's in the site review conditions. And I'm going to point out that we did require this plan to be revised. Why? The original plan showed that the distance between the in Smith's property and the northern edge of the driveway was less than 20. Feet. Yeah, because the requirement now is 20 feet in the town. And so now they agreed 
per this plan to move the edge of the driveway down so it's set back by 20 feet. But there's nothing, no annotations on this plan whatsoever about paving the apron. It's in the requirements of getting a curb cut. Well, that's 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 a key part of the issue. That's again not a planning board no, matter. And right. then there's questions about whether um, they legally can continue to use a pre-existing non-conforming gravel driveway without a paved apron. I don't know. But that's not our no, issue. Not. That's a building inspector key part. Right. So I again, when I build a house, um, I have to file a driveway permit. Keith approves it. And then Jim Hawkins can't issue a CO until Keith signs off and drive yeah. That's the procedure for the houses. So where I am with respect to the driveway is that um, while I might hope that there has been action between the MCTC at Seven River Road and, and Smith, the Board of Butter, to sort this out in a way that where Mr. Smith doesn't feel like vehicles are transiting his property or anything like that. Again, not our not within our authority to try to sort out. And at best, call the building inspector and call the building inspector and 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 yeah. adjudicate this. So, so I think where we're left, and in, in a moment, I'm just going to first ask Mr. Uh, open the floor and give Smith a chance to speak. Sure. I'll give the screen a chance to speak. Yeah. But my understanding, this is a my understanding of what the bounds of our authority and what we yep. can and should be doing. And CBA agrees with this. This is how they operate. Yep. This is why they put in their annual report. Like, we are not uh, enforcement. We don't have no enforcement or compliance powers. And that's the way they operate. Okay. Uh, so um, I'd like to give if Tim Smith has any questions or or comments about what we've, any clarification, what we've just discussed. Um, the floor is yours, Tim. Thank you. Um, no, I get it. I, if I want to move forward, I got to call the um, building uh, building inspector, right? Yes. And yes. and that, and that, okay. All right, I understand that. I get that. Legally. Legally, yep. that's, that's right. And as far as if it's, I have asked, you know, the, the board can, we can communicate with people and we can, um, you know, we can be a conduit for sending requests to the building inspector. We can, um, residents can raise, escalate their concerns to us, but we can't do, at best, all we can do is send a request on behalf of the board to the building inspector for an investigation. And then, and I'm really trying to even determine whether the building inspector is under any obligation. I mean, it would be nice if we are informed of what the building inspector does or does not do and what the outcomes are, but I don't know if there's I talked to obligation. Him yeah, well, I'm, and he's extremely responsive. That's my impression. But I gather he's also busy and yes. shared, and whether we a, can count a, on him to. He's a sharp guy. Yeah. There's the don't mistake his, don't mistake him being busy and not paying attention to what's going on. He is a very astute and he's, he's a very sharp guy. Okay. Yep. But also, again, so with respect to the driveway, I would, it's, it's as a, as a just a citizen of yeah. the town, resident of the town of Waverly, I would hope, and I, my experience with, the MCTC at Seven yeah. River Road is that they've tried to be good neighbors. Yeah. And if they can work things out, um, the driveway is the purview of the house. The, the, the details of the driveway and the any authority to require the MC, MCTC yeah. to make changes to their driveway again was falls under the highway department Correct. and any broader rules about grandfathering of pre existing yep. structures. That's all the highway superintendent. Right. All we can enforce is that the plan that the as built is consistent with the plan that we reviewed and approved. So, so right now to move forward, we are advising these people to reach out to the building inspector and or the highway superintendent to resolve these two issues and that they need to come back to us with a revised site plan with landscape screening. Well, so okay, right. I'll, I'll interrupt you. Say with respect to the driveway issue, yeah. if 
Tim Smith feels that there can, continues to be a driveway issue. Yeah. Um, then that is a matter between, I mean, I guess I would say, this is the road to hell. Like, I'd like to try to help, but I can't, yep. right? At best, I can say, I'm sorry, Tim, you have to either work it out with, get the highway department and or the building inspector to help with respect to the driveway issue. With respect to the screening issue, um, I just want people to understand any, I, my intuition from the seeing things on the ground is that the extent of the fence, the visible fence line uh, extends beyond the portion shown on this plan where we approved screening, okay. all right? So to manage people's expectations that there's a portion of that fence line that cannot be landscape screened and will be visible. But the, but the portion shown here should be screened. We don't what our at what we can do, and in fact, I believe if there is consensus here tonight, what I will do on behalf of this board is send a request to the building inspector to make a determination. That's the key word about the landscape screening requirement on this plan and how it, it and the, it is the building inspector who should direct the parties to well, come we, up with a revised plan. We, do, we don't have to have hearings. And, uh, we won't uh, need it, we but we will, like an ask a, bill, we will have to have a public meeting to review and approve a new plan, but not a public hearing. Does it need to be advertised? Uh, not any more than a regular public meeting. Okay, that's fine. That's my understanding. Okay. And I will simply say, oh, I could be wrong. <laughs> okay. So I will give you my best understanding of how this is going to play out. And I will confirm all of this with the anything else to say. Yeah. Um, and, yet, and then I want to just make sure, give the, Tim one more chance to speak, and then I'll see if uh, okay. Chris or Kate have anything to say. Yeah. The next step is Tim, thank you. You're you good with where we are? You understand the situation? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Okay. You know, trying to stay off that road to hell. Um, Kate or Chris? Do you care to come off mute or? Yeah, no, I'm all good. Okay. Okay. All right. So, that's going to be the formal next step from us to the building inspector. Sure. I don't think that really needs a, a formal vote mm -hmm. us to, to take that action. Uh, Sarah, Judy, any questions or comments about what we've just discussed about Seven River Road? Not me. No. Very good. All right. I'm going to stop sharing this. Okay. All right. Then we're going to move to the State road parcel. What we want to do is one second. Stop. That's so many so it is still be the community development. So here we go. All right. So the next topic should again share my screen. Share this photograph. And it'll be a similar conversation with uh, the, the Monahans who are present here tonight. So it was um, uh, it was brought to the board's attention. So it brought to the board's attention on drive-bys of the parcel uh, adjoining one uh, adjacent to 148 State Road. And what you can see in the image is that there's a large number of vehicles parked behind the recently expanded barn. And the question was raised: Is this consistent with so that parcel, as you know, is we attempted to zone, rezone it commercial. 
that did not pass the town meeting. There was opposition and it was tabled. No, actually, that parcel was zoned before I bought a commercial. When the city did some of the paperwork, it went to the state, got approved, then it came back out they took to rezone it to residential agriculture. Okay. That parcel was passed and was on the tax map as commercial plan. It is residential agriculture now. Yes. Yeah, it is. Yes. I don't know much so, about the history except what it is now. Yes. I just remember since my time on the board, I participated in the process of putting it up. Yeah. To town I, meeting. I remember because I was doing mine at the same time. But Mark Wendelowski owned that land. He yeah. was trying to get that changed to commercial as well. It was, yeah. it was never approved at town meeting. It was placed on the zoning map as commercial erroneously. And the, the um, attorney general approved the zoning map, but there is no town meeting backup for that. And which is why it's it's back where it was. I have a question about that. Sure. If it was erroneous, but it's somebody in the town's mistake and the attorney general approved it to be zoned commercial. No. That, that, but does it? I don't believe that is true. Okay. I do no, not... The zoning map reflects votes at town meeting. It doesn't stand on an, its own and it doesn't it it doesn't constitute a zoning change. It but supposedly it, shows yeah. Is the issue of the end that the use is not in compliance with it? Well again, I want to be very careful. I've learned my lesson here, that's right? Not our determination. It is we're not determining anything. Nope. What the the facts of tonight and why this is on tonight's agenda. Since we can't discuss things or should discuss things outside of public meetings via email, sure. is this information came to the board's attention and the question was what? All right. Everything on that parcel you're looking at is on there right now, except for the trailer. It is owned by me personally. Yes. By me personally. And the lot is owned by my wife and I yes. personally. Yes. And it's my right to park something on my land like it is yours. Yes. I'm not running a business out of that building right there that was held up has no cement floor in it. No water, no sewer, yep. and no electric to it. Okay. If you if you drive by and open the door, there's a dirt floor in there. I'm not running a business out of it. Okay. That's my right to park my stuff on my piece of property in the state of Mass. I have a piece of property at Three Bridge Street in Hatfield with 28 trucks parked on it that I own. Commercial. Okay. The parcel next to it has nothing to do with me. It's owned by my son. And the parcel next to that is owned by my wife. Yeah. Which is owned commercial. Okay. This parcel is my parcel. Okay. It's, the, so it's, it's actually hers. Excuse me. It's in her. Yes. So, so if someone has a problem, they have to write a letter to the building inspector and he makes a determination is the use consistent, consistent or inconsistent. That's right. And if they don't like his decision, they have the right to appeal to the zoning That's board or to the general court. I believe to land the court. They, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. not even first, the they, first they appeal to the zoning board. And then, so the, it's right. not even an issue for us. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I don't offhand know what to say, and I don't even believe it's my purview to make any judgments about what is or is not it's allowable on, on land. At I, best, I think what you say is that the person who notified you, you should inform of the proper procedure. Yeah. You go back to them, that person, and say, this is right. this is what this is you know appeal to the building inspector and if you don't like that determination then appeal to the zba yeah 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 well they get his decision and then he he goes to cba that's yeah i think there's a time limit on the appeal to the zba but yeah i think there's a the building inspector can always be appealed do we have a right to know who complained no, I don't know. I don't, know. I don't believe the building inspector acts on anonymous complaints. It has to be signed. Has to be signed. He has communicated to me that he won't act on anonymous complaints. Okay. Brad, I have one more question. Yeah. Is the chairman board correct? I am the chair, as of today, chairperson of the planning. As of, as of today, have you requested Jim Hawkins to write a review on this or ask him what he thought of it? I have not. You have not asked him as before. I, I asked this question that what well, I have communicated. So to be completely honest with you, when this came to my attention, I communicated to the building inspector 
to, to understand what the process was. If this were something that were not, you know, what's the process for uh, involving the building inspector? Did he, write, simply, did he write or reply anything back in an email because it's public he, information? He wrote an email back to me that is, I can share with you. I'd be happy to share yeah, with you. Problem, this right. basically says, just ask me to inspect it. Okay. And that's where I have not made any requests for inspection. Um, and I was really just coming to tonight's meeting with this picture to see if anybody on the planning board felt that there was any reason for us as a planning board to We're make such a request. I, I personally don't think that it's our call. I mean, uh, whoever's upset about this, uh, it's issue of the building is going to determine the use. It's not our call. That's we right. we do site events. That's right. So it's the it's a use issue. If the building determine the building inspector determines that it's a lawful use and a non-commercial use, then that's it. And if the, that party doesn't like that, they can appeal it. That's right. And if the building inspector says there is a problem, then we do it that way. It's not it's not an issue before us right now. So just and I am curious, is it and this is just pure curiosity. Um, are residents in town permitted to just put anything on their land? On any, well, like you, there are if limits. You drive, on... If you left here in about a five minute conversation and just drove up and down the streets that you live on, and you look right. at everybody there, you can tell me what you see. Yeah, see, I do see a lot of things. Like I've seen, there's a bylaw that says that that like RVs have to be like either screened or parked in storage. And I see a lot of RVs well, in let's your development. In the rest yeah. of the time. No, there's a town by it. We, this comes up with respect to new business later about uh, um, 151 River Road. Yeah. But there's a bylaw related to mobile homes and recreational vehicles. Right. Like I had, I have nine trucks. And five trailers. Yeah. My front yard could look just like that. And I have a lull and two scissor lifts. My front yard could look just like that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I have a home-based business. And I just don't have it there. So I, okay. I don't a home-based business is only allowed for four parking spaces. Um yeah. I have nine trucks. But again, yeah. one has to be careful because a lot of lots in Waitley have farm equipment and yeah. Farming is pretty much exempt from zoning. So um, this is clearly not farm equipment. And again, I think this is the building inspector's call. We probably yeah. shouldn't. We've got a long agenda. Yeah, OK. So I think that's all I'm going to do for tonight. So There's that, a, I just want to make sure you understand. Came to I our attention. And especially given what happened at last meeting that you didn't attend regarding Seven River Road, where I think I, you know, took on things that perhaps I should not have. I wanted to make sure everybody was on the same page about what we do, what we don't do, and how we operate. Perfect. Thank you. Any questions good. for me? Good. Okay. Good. Very good. Have, you can have too You're excused. <laughs> don't have All right. All right. All right. It's going to be. Um... There's a lot of cases in town, and this would all go back to the building inspector. When you have a home based business, a home occupation, a home occupation, and an accessory structure, a barn, so much they worked out of, yeah. and then whoever owned that doesn't own it anymore, and some other company moves into that space mm -hmm. and they're running their business out of a place that they don't live at. And there's multiple places yeah. in town that are like that. Within a mile yeah. of your house, there's multiple places yeah. like that. Yeah. Again, there I are... guess the only thing you can do is write a letter to the building inspector yeah. and complain and ask for them to make a determination. But there's a lots. Right. I mean, I think an, an open question, and I, I like, as Judy pointed out, we have a lot of things to cover. Yeah. And, but we may want to think about are there times, because remember, we are a planning board, but we are also waiting residents who are fully able to write letters. On our own behalf, yep. and if we feel like there's a concern, uh, it might be that a letter from the planning board to the building inspector would get more attention and priority than from a resident. But I believe you're only allowed to have one unregistered car lately for a registered vehicle. 
<laughs> if you would for that. So, uh, so we're gonna, if everyone's cool with this, we're yeah. gonna move yeah. on. Okay. Um, uh, I'll just give you a very quick update on the hiring of our board, board secretary. Very good news. Uh, I circulated this to all of you. So for the public record, yeah. we interviewed two candidates. One of them uh, withdrew before, you know, after the interview, leaving one with whom we were quite pleased, uh, Becca uh, Lipton Danielson. Uh, and she's, I think she's going to be great, but it's it's ultimately up to the select board to make the right. Uh Daughter, daughter of Roger Wood, uh, and works nearby. That's great. And and just seems like great, very sharp. So it's really good news. But I'm hoping that she'll be we'll be able to start working with her in July. All those important. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What I want to do in terms of old business, finally. Give me one chance to hopefully just get this common driveway side lot access application off of our agenda. But uh, so for my screen, I made a few more changes that I'll share with you, but maybe, maybe just maybe we can go to approve and share this. All right, so this is our this is our application for special permits, and um, I just made a I just made a little change from a good idea to it is recommended, uh, and then these were the in yellow. These are the changes that I made. In particular, I want to draw your attention to item number three, where we had a discussion about um, the certified list of abutters. So this, I made it. Uh, you can use the right one on the website. Yeah. Really. Of all property lines, said list shall be obtained from the town assessor. Okay. All right. That seemed like the easiest way to, without making it a long runoff sentence. So the certified list of abutters within 300 feet of all property lines of the affected parcel of parcels. Okay. Now, I, and this is where I'm gonna hopefully see if Judy has reason. Item four, I don't understand why it's needed. It was there, I'm thinking it could be struck given item three. Judy, do you have any idea why there was instructions related to names and ad addresses of owners of land across all highways and why this is needed potentially in addition to the 300 feet of butters? I don't. I I never noticed that. Um, I would perhaps speculate that 300 feet Honestly, don't know. Um, a butter, if there may have been a definition that a butter didn't continue across a highway, I I have no idea. I would think it could come out. Okay, so we'll with that. I'll simply delete item. So it'll be so Sarah was had suggestions about item one. So an accurate and legible should be self self evident, but an accurate and legible plan. And then I changed that last sentence on item one. A digital copy of the plan sent by email to planning board is encouraged to allow faster care. Okay. And then I just clarified this little bit of instruction just to make it very clear that review fees and or legal fees that are payable by the applicant may, may also be assessed. In addition, for the application. So this is advertising fees or something they've got covered. Yeah, there's it's noted earlier in a there's an asterisk after yeah, the application fee yeah. that says what you can see here yeah. full cost of advertising all the way to notices blah blah blah. Give you a chance to read that. Yeah. And then if I'll take any questions, and if not, maybe someone will move to 
approve this? I don't. I'm not sure with the intent of that paragraph in addition to the application fee. Are you, are you referring to engineering fees? Yes, it basically okay. seems the original instructions were like, if we need to hire anybody or to do reviews or do anything else, we don't incur the cost. Yeah, it's passed yeah. on to that. Oh, and maybe it should say something works. about professional for review professional fees. expertise to evaluate or here's a review fees um or that's that's poor wording but it doesn't really um professional what do we say professional Con consulting services professional I, it could be simpler if it said the, the applicant will will be rather than going through the applicant's going to have to pay it and then it may be assessed. You know. Can it can you it wanna, just? Well, if you want to propose, I want to bring this to a close. So if you have yeah. new language that you want to dictate, I'll do it. Otherwise, we're going to. I, I would change it to the the planning board may hire professional consultants payable by the applicant. Uh, and board may also hire consultants, professional uh, engineers or other consultants to to evaluate. To, to evaluate the project, which, and the applicant will bear the cost of these services. I think the sentence or the whatever statement that we already have basically already says that, but I think it's a little, I actually think it's a little more concise the way that it's written already. And I think okay, that fine. these professional- Leave it, leave it then, leave it. And legal fees. I think that encompasses what we're trying to say is that common fees that we often see in association with these applications are going to be passed on to the applicant and not covered by the board. I think it I think it could be very easily uh it could be very easy to get into the weeds trying to cover all of the different things that we may have to right. charge to them, but I think that what we have is vague enough that it's going to cover most circumstances. So you're good with the current? I, I think the current is, I think adding professional consulting services is helpful for people to understand what types of services they may be having to pay for. But I think what we have, yes, it's a little bit vague, but because it's vague, it's gonna cover good. what might come up. Sarah, how do you feel? She's yes, fine. this is good, it covers things. Okay. All right. That's it. Everything else, no good. other changes have been made. Sounds good. Good to move to the secondary. Move somebody other than me should move to approve this new site permit right. application form. I move to approve the new site permit application form. The motion is made. Uh, Judy seconded. Yeah, I'll Judy. Give, it to her. give it to Judy. Yes. Judy. Yes. Give it to Judy. All right. Motion has been made and seconded. Roll call vote. Sarah. Yes. Yes. Judy. Yes. Laura. Yes. JD. Yes. And Grant is yes. Anna, unanimous. Very good. Save it. I'll clean it up. Get it on the website. We can move on to the next agenda item. Okay. I think that's all the old business. So we can do some new business. Sylvia is here for the exit 35 study, so maybe we could take that first. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Yep. Why don't we? Um, so, this is the item discussing the report on the exit 35 study and associated zoning matters. We'll move that up to this part. Okay. Who would like to lead that discussion? Judy? 
So well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it so he can straighten me out after. But um, just a reminder, this, this is a study group. It's an ad hoc committee that was established by the select board to try and, I guess you would say, reinvigorate the the area around the intersection of State Road and 116 up by the Sugarloaf shops. And I sent you a, a PowerPoint presentation that a marketing consultant did for us. And I think if Brant calls that up, the first page gives an outline of the of the study area. So what would you like me to bring up? The, the, the slides? Yeah. There's do my screen share of those. Uh, but zoom in on the diagram on the all right. So let's go to the next page. Next page. Okay. Yeah. So that's the study area. It's basically um on the west it's it's the it goes well if we start at the south it's down below Tritown Beach to the to the lots below that on the west um mostly to the east of State Road a couple of lots over on the other side um the diner is included there and then up to the Sugarloaf shop complex and back down on Long Plain Road. But um, not including the Dunkin' Donuts. No, that's not in Whateley. Yeah, that's so just the park and ride. Okay. Just the park and ride. Okay. Um, so you have the full report. I think maybe if you want to hear the presentation, Sylvie can probably get the link from the recording. Uh, the woman who did the marketing analysis for the group was very good. I was very impressed. The, the there's a long lead up to the to the recommendations, which goes through marketing things that she found about traffic and where there's too much of a service, where there's not enough, and and it's actually quite fascinating. And an overview of of the various uh, zoning of the parcels in the area, which vary hugely, AR1, AR2, um, commercial, a multitude of parcels. Um, and then if you go to page, I think it's 10 or 11, there's, that's your page on. Recommendations leads off. Well, maybe go back to zoning and, and zoning constraints. First describes the, the number of parcels and the various types of zoning. Um, so that area, so there, yeah, so there are four different zoning districts all encompassed within that exit 35 area that you did, yep. that's been delineated. Okay. Yep. Um, and she talks about 15 land parcels analyzed as so we can perhaps explain better than I, but there are some parcels like the one to the south of the diner that's essentially wetland and you can't do much with. Um, the ones off Long Plain Road extension, there's no water access there. Um, so it seems unlikely that you could do much there. Um, and the same south, well, anyway. So what fascinated me was um, she, she focused on something I hadn't very much, that the parcels are small and our lot coverage requirements limit the amount of size that you can put on a building. Um, and also the current zoning makes a mixed use building trigger a larger minimum lot size and the higher frontage requirements. So the way it is now, you actually couldn't have two-story mixed use there. 
And I think you all know mixed use is where you permit both commercial, explicitly permit both commercial and residential in, in one structure. It's typically with the commercial on the lower level for, for you know, obviously marketing appeal and the like and the residential above. They're typically in more of a, a village kind of construct. So the small lots uh, behind the Sugarloaf shops would be appropriate and they often have design criteria. You know, so they look, so they're designed to look relatively the same and, and typically with restric restrictions on the size of the structure overall. And so that's that, but there's a lot there that you can't do. One thing that she didn't mention on this page that it is, is a real problem is that the parking our zoning bylaw is very restrictive or, or requires an awful lot of parking spaces for commercial uses, more than smart growth does these days. And so that in order to get more commercial activity there, you would, I think, definitely have to revisit the parking bylaws. So then if you could go to the next page, Grant, um, we've been calling it the exit 35 exchange interchange. Um, obviously that lacks pizzazz. Um, the, these are the non-zoning, um, recommendations. She thinks it would be useful to create, a, an outdoor marketplace, uh, maybe a pop-up a couple on Saturdays or something, giving a chance for makers to sell their wares and discover that, gee, there might be a market. There's a lot of traffic through that area. And, and she also, that might be at the parking area for the Sugar Loaf shops. This, this, is, this is all hypothetical, I should say. And also she recommended talking to DOT about um, using perhaps the park and ride area for something like that. Um, she says there's never more than 40% occupancy there. And it's usually a lot less than that. So that's the kind of recommendations that, that this marketing study came out with. And then if we go to the next page, um, basically step back. She's recommending basically step back and see what you can do to help make more commercial development there. Um, more, more commercial zoning, um, change minimum sizes, um, develop a new zoning district. I would, I think she's talking basically about an overlay district that you might call, you know, whatever, say it becomes Waitley Crossing or something like that, Waitley crossing um, district, but, and I think everybody on the study committee or most people on the study committee and the housing committee also feel that this is, a, would be a good place for mixed use buildings that would combine both commercial and housing, a way to get some more affordable housing and also more, more stores. So, so yeah. one of the next steps for the study committee is to start to focus on what really, what, what kinds of zoning changes should be there. And Sylvie was nice enough to ask the, the consultant who did this to propose a scope of work where she would work with the committee and also the planning board to develop these, these concepts. Um, the study committee met, they aren't ready to recommend either a consultant or a scope of work. Um, Sylvie's been, <laughs> excuse me, 
asked to check with another, a couple more consultants to see what they might do. Um, it's also, if you remember, we get these proposals for DLTA funding through FERCOG. FERCOG can't take on something like this now, but I think if the planning board wanted to prioritize this for a DLTA project, that would be great. Um, so that's an option. As district local technical assistance or advice? Thank you. I can never remember what it stands for. Um, Silly, did you want to add anything to that? Um, so yeah, I think um, uh, Judy, you also sent everybody the the scope of work that you would um, referenced, and it is um, just uh, helpful to give us an idea of uh, what one consultant or or pair of consultants might um, uh, think this project looks like. Um, and I'll be seeking some some other um, some other input from from different consultants so that we can make a better informed decision. Um, but I guess. Uh, it would be um, helpful just to know um, the planning board's thoughts in terms of willingness to um, engage with this project. Um, of course, uh, we don't have funding yet for the next phase and we're still trying to formulate our plans, but um, uh, the planning board will, will um, definitely be uh, needed in this effort. Um, so I wonder, um, your thoughts on sort of uh, a timeline and capacity for um, uh, taking on this type of work and just um, any initial uh, impressions that you might have. So, JD, you had to come. I just have some general comments. Um, I spoke with Keith Bardwell more than a month ago about this. He was, we were just talking to we could catch a bunch of stuff. And I certainly don't want to put words in his mouth. But he was saying that a big hindrance is waiting is prohibition on drive throughs. Drive I'm sorry, I'm sorry, JD, I didn't hear that. The, prohibition big, on prohibition on drive through. Drive through. Yeah. Well, that's the kind of thing that. It has that, that, had a general. It's only by law. It's a zoning bylaw. It's a zoning bylaw that yeah. he, he, he was saying, and again, I don't want to speak for him, but his opinion that I, my interpretation of his opinion was that we would get a Starbucks, you could get a Dunkin' Donuts, you could get all sorts of stuff if you allow a drive through because we're not. We, we, well, not I think that that's the kind of comment that um, we're looking for going forward. Uh, and I'm I, sure there's a billion others. I love the concept of maker spaces and food trucks and all that stuff, but that doesn't bring the tax revenue to the town that something would have done. The idea us. behind that was that if somebody found that there was a demand for their product, they might well be more conducive to opening a store. It's it's kind of a a um segue a lead in to encouraging to to think that gee this is a good spot where we could rent yeah so like so something with a foundation yes yeah. tax revenue totally to get it. it food trucks don't yeah under commercial uses we list take out or drive in food services as a use so it's in our table of use it's not those are not allowed in ar1 or ar2 but they are allowed by special permit in the other three zoning districts. Oh, the drive drive up windows are not allowed lately. Unless it's but why is this, what's the difference between that and a drive in food service? That's like driving in a town's hot dogs to get done, to get. Like a takeout window. A takeout window, a drive up window. Like, or like wow. Simmer's ice cream, like that type of so, stuff, I think. If I, I run it's in there somewhere. Do, do, do you believe that to be true? That, that, that there's no, there's no use that would cover. I mean, they didn't, they didn't want McDonald's. Would this be because a Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donuts are, you know, takeout or drive-in food services, but they also have a, a drive-off window a drive versus. But I, you, I know you, you've said that multiple times, and I don't word. know that that's true based on what I've seen in the bylaws. Judy, do you know this to be true? I don't know it to be true. Um, Maybe it's it, could, it could be. 
and and I haven't studied. I do think that's kind of the level of detail that we don't need to get into tonight. Right. Um, the other thing was that um, when Floyd Andres built the Sugarloaf Shops, yeah, he was trying to ride it on the coattails of Mike Cabbage. Oh, that he was trying to create a space that looked like Yankee Candle yeah. to make it a commercial place. It never really got off the ground. Yeah. It's always kind of foundered this discount stores, medical center in there, it's a marijuana shop right yeah. now. He built a building without a need of us because oh. people just went right to Yankee Candle. Yeah. I wouldn't be su surprised if they demolished that and put in a different structure there if it was more use of sellers in the future. And Keith also pointed out that on Old City Road, the old Fox Fertilizer plant, that's now clean now. And there's some elderly people in that lot. A developer could go in there and develop that whole place. Very that's also a brownfield site. So is it clean though? Or but again, we're yeah. These are all great comments, and I think it shows that we need the study group needs input from the planning board, and yeah. it's the kind of cross fertilization that we're hoping to get. Yeah. May I give in response to Sylvie's question about capacity? Um, you know, and this actually this sort of topic came up as I was talking to another potential board candidate to, to fill the coming vacancy. Um, board member capacity is only so much, right? You know, to, to do extensive projects. I think I would say, speaking for me personally, I'm very supportive of trying to do something in this area to help make, especially given what JD said earlier about the finance committee's desire and just general desire to improve the tax base of Waitley. So to try to make something happen up in this, this corner of the town and do zoning changes required. Um, but it's a there's a potential heavy lift. Like I, I know I don't personally have the skill or knowledge to start writing new zoning bylaws. So and I think the understanding was if there's if funding for some organization that would be sort of the primary instigator, like I don't think I could do something tabula. No. No, it's it's understood that there will have to be a consultant. I mean, I made it very clear that the right. nobody on the planning board has has the expertise to do this, and um, but it it's also I think important that the planning board be aware. Pete Kane commented at the study group meeting that it's unwieldy to have two committees really working on the same project or, or let's say implementing it. But he thought that the um, it was important that the planning board liaison bring comments back and get, get input from the planning board. So I think, is that a fair comment, Sylvie? Yeah, I think that that's just right. Um, we would have a, a consultant um, do the heavy lifting of the drafting of any um uh, potential zoning change um ha having the planning board um feedback as we go through that process um uh, would be necessary but um yeah uh, we would be um sensitive to the fact that the planning board can't take on this project um uh in part or in in, in full um but we we do need um that communication um so i think that's i think that's definitely fair and one thing I thought, you know, I agreed to stay on the study committee and I'm happy to continue to be the liaison, but it might be that you folks would rather have a an active member of the planning board be your representative. And that's that's another issue. Well, so I don't know what else there is to say on this topic. I mean, uh, I did look at the draft scope. I did look at the draft schedule. My sort of gut level reaction to the schedule is that it seemed to think, presuppose that things would be able to move a lot faster. You know, it, it seemed to suggest a, like an eight month start to finish. Um, and that, 
could work, but there's a lot of months of development and even before you get into the public hearing. So I, it just seemed like that might have been an optimistic schedule. Um, well, uh, for my part, um, I'm just glad to know it that um, uh, you all are interested to, uh, uh, to see um, some uh, what we can what we can sort of devise uh, for potential zoning changes that would help to um, uh, stimulate uh, business and potentially um, you know possibilities for housing um, in and around that area too. So I think that um, that's all I need for now. And um, if you all could also think about um, what Judy had mentioned, um, whether you want to um, have an active uh, planning board member join in with a study group. Um, and just let me know about that. That'd be great. And if uh, if you like, I can send over the the full market analysis if you're curious to take a look at that. Um, and um, any other material you want to see, we have you, we have. I know you recorded the meeting where Kathy came to the study group and presented this. this yeah, I can. Uh, you could send a link for that. I think. Okay. It would. She she did a very good job of explaining those earlier pages, and it gives a, I think a very, it's not necessarily, well, it is good background for the zoning, and and I think it's, it was also very very interesting work she did. Dad, can you put pepper on? Mm -hmm. um, All right, well, thank you. Can you put pepper on? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sylvia. <laughs> I think I have the power on this one to mute um, with that one, whoever joined. So, all right. Okay. Um, okay, let's say about that. Now I want to mix up. Yeah, okay. Oh, I mean, I guess I did have one other. Still be, still be still there. I guess my feeling was that it, at a certain point, it would seem like the planning board is the right forum to be discussing specific zoning changes um, versus have them developed entirely outside and then at some very late period point of development kind of then bestowed upon the planning board to, to carry on. But, um Perhaps uh, we could think about um, since the the exit thirty five study group is an ad hoc committee. Perhaps we would get to a certain point where we would have finalized sort of the recommendations for the drafting, and then it could be handed off um, at, for the planning board to to steward that. Um, uh, but that's yeah, that I, I that's noted, and um, I'll I'll I guess I'll talk with you more about that as we get further along with this um, idea. Ad hoc committees, for your reference, are purely advisory. Very good. All right. Um, anything else on this exit 35 topic? All right. Hearing none, we'll move back to our regular new business agenda. So I circulated with all of you the letter from the building inspector related to 151 Hilbert Road. We were talking about that at the last meeting. Um, it Can you stop out, hearing? Was that Judy? Could you stop sharing? Thank you. Thanks for Finder, stop sharing. Uh, so we were talking about 151 River Road, and the, the so it turned out that somebody somebody did file a complaint with the building inspector. The building inspector made a determination uh, and has communicated with both me. And Deborah Carney from the DBA about this bylaw we have on the books that speaks to mobile homes and recreational vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, and you saw the letter where the building inspector determined that the bylaws, our definition for mobile homes is out of date and basically supported the CBA's issuance of a special permit allow the project to go forward. And uh, the verbal counsel from uh, Jim Hawkins to me was that we would be well advised to consider um, reviewing and revising that particular Bible. 
So I didn't really have much to say about that, but um, I spoke with Jim. I, first, I spoke with Bob um, Smith at town meeting, and I asked about 151. He said it was the most compelling case it's got before him from an applicant for what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And Jim Hawkins' comment to me is that it's a HUD house. Yeah. And as long as it has a HUD stamp on it, it's not a mobile home, it's a HUD house. Right. We're going to see a lot of them. Yes. Because the cost point that they're at, they are exempt from our building codes because it's a HUD house. Yeah. They're exempt from our energy codes. Uh -huh. He says, you came in with a plan for a HUD house, he pretty much has to accept it. There you go. Okay. Yeah, there's no, there's no other. It's a yeah. manufactured meet HUD performance standards, and that's it. Now, is it the case that any manufactured home is necessarily a HUD home? As long as it's if it has that HUD, as long as it's a HUD, if it meets the HUD requirements, yes, right. So we could be seeing developments that put HUDs because they're cheap. Yeah. Well, this dollars. is again a note. All I want to do is put this out there now. Yeah. As we start to think about the future, yeah. that we don't. Um, we seem to have an outdated bylaw that speaks about mobile homes. We don't seem to say anything about manufactured homes, which is a new trend and is another way to achieve more affordable housing in Waverly. Uh, but <laughs> the reason the complaint was filed is because some people have a particular feeling about these manufactured homes. There were trailers in town that I think when the occupant died or moved, they'd take them down. So some of them have stayed and have not been taken out. They're supposed to come down. Mm -hmm. The one on Aiden Hill Road that's still there, they're supposed to come down that didn't come out. But, yeah. So potential future, future matter. Mm -hmm. um, the next topic was did circulate the report from NextAmp about landscape screening at the, their facility at 134 Christian Lane. Um, didn't come in tonight, tonight with a particular agenda here. I'm just bringing it up with one quick comment here. Christian Lane. So, tree replacements. Just a real quick screen share of this. We're all on the same page about what we want. So, a very short report that just basically says that they replace 24 trees and bushes. Um, I meant to go back and again, look at whatever report. We don't, I think, ha I don't think we have in our electronic files for ease of access, the details on what the plan was that was, but we did talk at our last meeting about how screening of this facility on Christian Lane seems like it's not great. Like the the spirit of screening is that it hides <laughs> what is behind the landscape. And here it seems like there's some rant, some shrubs that seem to have no hope. And I'm not sure what. And Sarah pointed out at the last meeting that this land is not ideal for growing things because it's wetlands or it's swampy. Um, I don't have a strong, any comments about this? Is there an action we can or should take with respect to improving the screening of this facility? I mean, I have a question based on the other property that has essentially the same issue where there's a problem with the screening that yes. is proposed or in place. Um, is this even, I mean, I think the screening looks terrible, but is there anything we can even do about it? Like, is it well, you're in, right. in our jurisdiction? So, yeah, so I point taken. Yeah. Like really, I think we could now acting as a board, right. make the request of the building mm -hmm. inspector to inspect this property and make a determination. The only thing that I wonder about is, you know, 
just my own experience of looking at conditions we put in about screening sure. is it's not you know the 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 desired outcome after x amount of time of yeah. is not explicit okay you know we i think we all know what we want but we have not written right in, in, so judy you were involved in the site review for this facility is that correct Yes, and Sarah was as well. And Sarah was as well. I think in order to, before you do anything, you should pull up the conditions. And also um, the minutes about when we've reviewed it between, I mean, this is not the first time we've we've gone back and looked at this. And my memory is that we required sort of a mixed kind of planting. And... Sarah, do you, I mean, you're, you're much closer to this. You must remember better. Yeah, it was some holly. We definitely wanted some deer, um, the tree of uh, more bushes that were deer prohibited, that wouldn't get chewed on regularly. This is a major deer and um, coyote corridor. Um, they are minimally compliant and they're going to stay as minimally compliant as they can. So I don't, Personally, I don't think they can pull the legalities of we are doing the bare minimum. They would not say that. They are doing what it says in the in the um, conditions. I think this is a property we learn from and being more specific. Very much about, so. This was a very early, early attempt to oversee these. Um, since then, we've been much more specific about varieties and heights um, and, and had more specific drawings. We didn't have any drawings for this. We just had um, verbal requirements. And I think even those were in the minutes rather than in the site plan conditions. It's been conveyed clearly. Well, I think Sarah's right. This is minimally compliant and the best we can do. The things that are in the minutes don't have the same don't really have force compared right. to what's either on the plan or in the conditions that were set by the planning board in writing. And I have a suggestion, maybe, um, and this might be something that's already been done, so it's kind of a question. Is it applicable to say, like, we are requiring that there's adequate screening up to, you know, 80% of full coverage of the fence line within five years to, like, give the plants time to to grow yeah. and then that way we have something to go back on and say well your fence line is you know 200 feet long and there's clearly 75 feet that you can see you know even if it's in between cracks or whatever like maybe we have to figure out it's hard to quantify a view but maybe there's a way to figure out a percentage or something like that where we have something to fall back on in a situation like this where we can say you know if you go out there and measure there's 10 foot patches that have no no covering, no screening in front of them. Right. Well, you make a great point because uh, the conservation view, the university type process for human wetlands, if you um, have to replicate wetlands, you have to give an operations and maintenance plan for those replicated wetlands for four or five years. You have to monitor them. You have to guarantee the performance and the, the, um, the, the, the establishment of the wetland that wetland that's working that the, the, the um, the floor is coming up. You have to do that to take in the final people. This is right. not wetlands because it was agricultural. Was and it stays with a piece of agricultural land in front. They also minimally crop that and don't, they haven't gotten a harvest off of it the last couple of years or a, a success, a particularly successful one. But again, it's minimally compliant. Yeah, my, my point, Sarah, wasn't to argue those wetlands, but just that. Um, yeah. uh, Thing that they, the Conservation Commission required a four or five year plan that worked. Right. Yeah. Do. So the that's act, a state law for the Conservation Commission. There, I think you're correct, Judy. Yeah. Yeah. So on this topic, what I plan to do, try this involves going into paper files, yeah. which is going to be a scary prospect. But I will go and see what I can find out about a plan, the conditions. Mm -hmm. Set on this property. I think you will find, I'm not sure it's worth the effort. I don't think you'll find anything very helpful. I 
but I, I'll at least do that or give up. I, maybe what I'll do, Judy, you'll be off the board by then, but I will take this as permission to drop it, it seems. <laughs> okay, so fine. I will I provide just an editorial comment. I mean, we focus a lot on screening and usually because the abutters want it. But if I have to look, think about what's the least obtrusive solar facility in town, it's the one at Fairview Farms that it has no screening at all. It just kind of disappears. Yeah, yeah, that's the one just way far back. Yeah, you don't even really notice it. You don't notice that it's there. It's, and and every attempt to screen, you either get an ugly fence or dying shrubs or both. And I mean, and is I, it? That's, but that's just a personal opinion. But I think if I were doing this again, I would resist a butter's attempts for screening and point that out. There's there's nothing really bad looking about a solar facility. I almost wonder if it would be, um, if this is possible, maybe somebody can tell me. Uh, is it possible for us to say, instead of a chain link fence, can we require them to put out either a solid oh, yeah. wood we, fence or whatever, or even like a nice like black, like and iron type that, fence or whatever? We've done that at River Road. We've yeah. We've specified it elsewhere about yeah. the type of fence. Those are exactly. But, but, but there are two issues. The chain link fence is a security fence for the facility. And we can require another fence in front of it, but I think they would want something of that ilk for security. Right. Well, but what I'm saying is maybe instead of asking them to spend all this money on shrubs that nobody cares for and then they die and they're obviously not serving a purpose anyway, in this case, maybe it's better to say they can run their chain link fence, but then, you know, five feet outside of that or however far outside of that, we're going to request that they run, you know, a wooden like stockade type fence that blocks the view and still provides them really with an added layer of security. And nobody yeah. has to worry about looking We've like We've done I that twice. Trees. There are two there are two facilities on Chestnut Plain Road with fences like that. I'll have to look I, more closely next time I, I drive. I personally it. think they're not much of an improvement. One is okay. down by Jane Gripko's house. Um mm -hmm. okay. but you, you can look one, and this one, the one that's roughly opposite where Sarah lives on Christian Lane. Mm -hmm. Has a wooden, what faces the road is a wooden, is a wooden fence. Okay. Fence. And then it's chain link all around it perpendicular right. to the road. Right. And so, and in fact, unfortunately, I think because it's a very light colored, like ash, light wood yeah. fence, yeah. it actually, the, the lack of landscape screening, it makes it worse because now the dark, not well, yeah. not. Smooth. Right. Or do we require. A wooden fence with some shorter shrubs, like you know what I mean. You, I feel like there's, and I don't really care as much about what's on the road. It would, I would have more of an opinion, I guess, if it was in my backyard. So, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen. But, um, I just wonder if there's a better way to do it or better, whatever. Maybe there's a, a different process that we could try. And so I'm going to now oh. use this yeah. to go back to <laughs> Judy's point. I think the important takeaway here is. We should learn from this and we should think about these screening because I myself have some mixed feelings about these screening requirements as well. Um, and either we try to go really very detailed and very specific and with performance standards and how much time, blah, blah, blah. Or we kind of say it's just not, we we try to do things that don't involve landscaping mm -hmm. with fence design or something. Right. Judy, do you have a, can you live with moving on or do you have an important point you want to make on this? No, I just made my editorial comment. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Judy, appreciate it. All right, so we've got this, 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 um, 6.30. Um, so the preliminary discussion of board priorities for 2025. But I guess what I, I didn't necessarily see this as a decision. Well, I did not see tonight as a decision. I did want to start us all thinking about 
what this is going to mean. And my, I know this is not this has not been uniformly true. I've only been on the board a few years, but from my from what I've observed in the short time I've been on the board, um, all the project work has been done by Judy. <laughs> Um, so to the extent that this board is going to do new work in the, in 2025, um, it's going to either be things like the exit 35 thing where money somehow is found for a consultant and we are collaborating with that consultant. But of course, we own the process of public hearings and so on and so forth. And we get the our final sale if right. it's approved. Um, or if any of us have a particular passion for something, I've been making my own list of a half dozen or more things that I have come up that kind of need doing. And some of which I'm sure that I'm going to just take on as a, but I really just sort of wanted you all to think, and I'm not going to ask anybody yeah. to like wave their hand, but if, if there's anything new that's going to get done, it's going to be because each of us takes on something and then we all get to provide, you know, assistance and input and advice, but somebody owns mm -hmm. a particular activity. Uh, I know because this is uh, her last night with us in as a formal member, I did want to at least pop up the document that she that she circulated about her suggestions. Sorry, I'm going to give her a chance just to have a little bit of a Q and A about that. If, if you're okay with that, Judy. Sure. My screen. Hearing something. All right. So, um, so I've I've already covered the first bullet, which is getting the zoning map layer back and the assessment map. So that was going. So Judy, on the re resource replacement fee. How do we effectuate that bullet? That's a good question because I've been trying to do it for years here. Um, in theory, it's up to the select board. And I think what it actually needs to happen is to get it on Pete Kane's calendar, his tickle file, that it means it needs to be done every time the tax rate is set. And there's Excuse me. Judy, Judy, can you explain what the resource replacement fee is? Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we passed a revised bylaw um, on solar siting. And as a component of that, required that if, if we're trying to get more protection for agricultural and timberland and still allow siting. And as a protection, as a requirement in the bylaw, we said that if, if a solar facility is built on land that's been in chapter any time in the last five years, either chapter 61 or 61A or 61B, that the um, developer would have to pay this resource replacement fee, which is assessed, there's a formula in the bylaw. It's basically a fee established based on the difference between the value of the land in chapter and, and the market value. It's a one-time fee and it has to be reset every year once the once the market value assessment is is made and once the state issues its uh, chapter values and 
it got done easily the first time. The, the process is to go to the assessor's office, get them to do the calculation. They, they know all the land in chapter. And they, they can calculate the average market value, the average um, chapter value, and do the calculation. I don't have the formula in front of me. Um, but it should be there so that if somebody does do this, we can tell them what the fee is. So there's an action that I can follow up with speaking about. And would you, Judy, before June 30th, just send the last relevant conversation, you know, documentation of like the yep. last I actually can probably, it may be after June 30th, because we're leaving to go to the Cape, but I will get it to you. I don't fall off the earth, you know. It's, it's, right, that's still be around. That's um, and then in your third bullet, I was curious, Judy, if you thought that our ANR and special permit application fees were too high, too low, or not well justified, or what was your thinking behind that? Well, I was thinking that I spoke to early. Sarah brought this up when we we moved to make the applicants pay the special permit fee should should we change the size of the application fee and we talked about it and we said well um there's still all the costs involved and mail is expensive and stuff but i think in retrospect it, it probably is worth have, taking a little time and i don't think it's a big exercise to figure out what the act actual cost of dealing with public hearings is. I mean, that's that's the cost you're trying to cover. And so yeah, postage is up. I'm sure we're paying the assistant more than was the case when when the fees were originally settled. But that those fees did intend to cover the the legal fees. And on the other side, um, some things are easier, you know the the a butters list comes off the computer and it comes with mailing labels. You know, all you have to do is slap them on the envelopes or on the postcard or whatever. So, um, and, you know, mail merge is a lot easier and all of that kind of thing. So I think maybe if somebody just kind of got a sense of what the typical, and might might want to have the new secretary or assistant or whatever the title is, work with at least one public hearing to get or, or two to get a sense of it. But I, I think probably the fees are too high and we should have a justification okay. for what they are. Do you think we should, could, there's an opportunity to adjust them downward because all the other things were already requiring the applicants? Yeah, I, I mean, we deal with affordability all the time and yeah. And um, the legal fees are, are just extortion. And I've been trying to talk to Jessica about ways to make the ads smaller. And I think probably something could be done there, but that's really outside the planning board. You're on that point, and this goes a little bit, this is a little bit of a tangent, so I'll keep it short. Because I had a conversation about the legal advertising and legal advertising costs. Um, he pointed out, he said, number one, the state has been talking about um, amending the Zoning Act and the requirements for public hearing notices to remove the requirement that notice is published in a newspaper of record. It hasn't happened yet, yeah. but there's talk. Mm -hmm. Good. He, he, Kane said for us, um, when it comes to site reviews, site reviews and the procedures for site reviews are not specified in the zoning act. Everyone gets to decide how they do it based on what's in our own bylaws. Our current bylaws specify that we provide notice consistent with the zoning act, which means we have to do uh, put uh, ads in a paper of record. However, 
we could choose to modify our bylaw to change the requirements to no longer say that our our site review public hearings provide notice identical to what's laid out in the in the zoning we could simply say we do want to notify our butters within 300 feet by mail yeah but we could change the way we do site reviews so we don't have to pay legal acts sometimes now, but fine and i think some towns may not even do public hearings mm -hmm. For site plan reviews. Again, not required by the zoning act. Is that done at town meeting or is it done? Well, that would be a zoning bylaw. We would have to make a change to our zoning bylaws around how we, our procedures for site reviews. And we would have to decide what is appropriate notice. And, but right now, we do this and we incur all of these costs because our bylaws require that we wait and the state changes the zoning act, then that will solve the problem for us. He said probably all the newspapers will fight it right. because that's the that major source that. of revenue. Yeah. And honestly, I have some mixed feelings about, you know, we've lost so much in local coverage. Uh, and all we do is we stop right. paying local ads. But so we'll, we'll be so Anyway, th this was a tangent. I just wanted to be prepared. That's okay. I have a quick question yeah. to kind of follow up. Um, but with the changes we just made to that application, yes, we're now. But that is uh, the instructions for a special permit. Permit. Oh, okay. But and the is... rules for special permits uh -huh. require all... so special permits and site reviews are okay. different. Well, okay. So special, special permit, permits, we don't have to put. This no, we do. Out? For special okay. permits, special permits are just are and the procedures yeah. and notice on special permits are specified in detail in the zoning act. Okay. And do require notice in a paper plan. Okay. So the ZBA has to do it right. and incur those costs. And we, when we do special permits, must do the same. Right. Site reviews is not different. a different story. Okay. But in, in regards to a special permit. We're now passing that cost on to the applicant anyway, right? Are. So that's irrelevant. Yes, it is irrelevant. Okay. But, but for site, site right. If site reviews, it would still for be site there. reviews, Same we would never do special permits. Okay. But we right. do well, well, keep an eye on the text. Certain times mm -hmm. a year we do site yeah. plan reviews. So if we were able to make site plan reviews more affordable. Mm -hmm. By not imposing this legal advertising right. cost on the applicant, that could be a good thing. Yes. But we couldn't make that happen until next annual town right. meeting. And we collectively would have to agree to do this right. and make that and figure out how to do it. Okay. My comments, I appreciate Judy's point about special term the, the fees. However, when we have legal fees, advertising fees that we can't bill to a customer. To someone in front of us that helps offset that. Like when we well, yeah, but we've taken we pretty much solved that problem because we did for site reviews we already build those costs. Right, but when we just when we just did um the air. Oh, oh, you're we, right. I'm sorry. That's right. Whenever we initiate we a mean, public hearing, yeah, we have those expenses that offset so helps. And again, I think that's required by the zoning act. Okay, but yeah, you're saying it goes into the pool. Yeah, basically. The planning okay. board is given money by the town, right. and then all of the fees they collect don't come back to the planning board, they right. go back to the yeah. town. Right. That's a good point, right? So if we only think about our ANR and special permit application fees in a very transactional way, this is the fee to cover mm -hmm. this thing. What we're really doing is saying, well, the fee, some of the fee covers this thing, but some of the fee is sort of accumulated for all the things that we can't that actually get. Yeah, those funds go. You might, right. We're into discussing what probably should be a process, but if you when you do get to discuss this, you might think think about equity and whether that's really fair. Yeah. If one person is doing something that they wind up helping something else. We are given a town budget for this. Yeah. We it's really are. up to the budget, right? So that the taxpayers as a whole pay for it. 
But and anyway, I don't should, I, you're talking about priorities and we're into fixing it already, which is encouraging, but. Okay. So in terms of the projects, so you sent around this comment about um, trying to work with Pete and the select board to get a general bylaw versus a zoning bylaw to address battery storage. Yep. So that's your first bullet. I think that makes sense. I do know, I mean, I, while I personally have some mixed feelings about opposition to battery storage, I understand where it's coming from the town. And I know that if that there are people who will come out in large numbers to oppose battery storage projects in town. So, uh, so that might be something that, and I think that's reasonable. Um, the second bullet about revising the subdivision bylaws, again, Judy, that sounds like something we would need to obtain funding and probably work with. No, 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 this is easy. This is easy. Is it? Uh, is yeah. it easy for Judy or is it easy for? Like, well, I, I plan to send you a, a what I was going to call a plan of attack, but um, there are, this is just revising the bylaws. This isn't doing a comprehensive review. This is just take out the things that are really making subdivisions expensive that we know don't make any sense or the town doesn't want. There's a requirement for sidewalks. There's a requirement for street lights. There's a requirement for storm drains. Um, there's a requirement that that roads be 25 feet wide. Um, none of those make any sense. And it would be the first three, you can just pull them out. Um, it wouldn't take too long to get some sense of what a decent road width is. I think for Pine Plains, we wound up at 17 feet, but I don't. You know, looking at a couple towns bylaws could give you, or subdivision rules could get you that. And for the storm drains, it's a matter of getting wording on rain gardens and things. But you start with the waivers to Pine Plains, you get an outline of what can be done. And, you know, it's a couple meetings, but it's not a huge, it's a couple questions to FERCOG. It's it's not a big deal, so it and it be, doesn't have to go to town meeting. You can do it. it on might your. be a bigger deal when one lacks the corporate knowledge that you bring to the table. Well, but as I, was, I said, I think there's no. It's, it's a good way to learn. It is, but this could very well be like if this were. A I I will send a plan of attack, an outline of the way I would go about it. Okay. All right, noted. And then the floodplain flood plain bylaw, we, we know about. So I really need to follow up with Sylvie now that there seems to be a new FEMA map available. And that was, there is a trigger that when a new FEMA map became available, we had a certain, the state, there was a certain deadline imposed on cities and towns to get a new floodplain bylaw in place. So I'll follow up with. But basically, the bylaw is drafted with minor tweaking that may have already been worked out between, say, the CONCOM and Sylvie. So all we would have to do in 2025 is go through the process, I believe, mm -hmm. like doing the public hearings and so forth. And and there's a there's pressure on it. So I I think dealing with the floodplain bylaw is something where will be actually relatively easy and a kind of a must do in 2025. And then I think we know where we are with the exit 35 in the study. Good. Well, thank you, Judy. Um, I'm going to close that topic unless you have anything to add. All right, what I'd like to do, and then slide. So I want to do approval. I think that concludes new business. I just want to do approval of minutes. So soon I will no longer have to do minutes. I circulated minutes, draft minutes of our meeting 
on May 29th. Do you hear that? I received no, I received no changes. So, so last chance for anyone to propose any amendments or revisions to the minutes of our last meeting. And if not, any one of you could make a motion to approve. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of 529 2024. Okay. Second. The motion has been made and seconded. Roll call. Sarah. Yes. Judy. Abstain. I wasn't there. That's a good point. Yes. Laura. Judy. Yes. Grant. I wrote them. I like it. <laughs> so, yes, approved. All right. Get those, you will get those posted. All right. I will just, this is the farewell, but not goodbye to Judy Markland. You're working on this, Judy. You will very soon have your own <laughs> personal <laughs> the camera. We have all but one signature outstanding. It will be beautifully framed like the ones that you've seen. Again, to uh, in recognition of your outstanding and sustained commitment to the planning board. I just personally want to say thank you. I know you're not going away. I'm sure your influence will continue to be felt. Uh, and I hope you will answer emails from me after June 30th, because I'm sure- I'd be happy to stay on the mailing list if that would help. I will surely have questions. I just, Judy has been a great source of education. She's been patient. Um, uh, she's been unstinting and just gen being gen generous and just dealing with my ignorance and confusion around many things. So I, I know I sometimes think that most of the zoning bylaws are written by Judy. I know that's not really true, but I know she's had a tremendous I impact. I didn't have anything to do with the ham radio one, I can tell you. <laughs> she didn't do that one. I'm sure she didn't do the one about mobile homes either. Um, but yeah, I mean, thank you. Would you, is there anything, you know, would, would you like to say like for the record? I have one thought, uh, just a general comment or maybe piece of advice, uh, thinking about it. Um, when we get a question about a bylaw and there's a problem and very often there's a problem, I think there's a tendency to rush to fix it. And I'm as guilty of this as anyone without stepping back and thinking, gee, why is that bylaw there to begin with? I think all of these things were written to meet a certain circumstance. We all know how hard it is to get them through. You have to have a lot of public comment. And obviously things change over time, but it really is important. Um, when I was working on the, for the Historical Society, I was working on the 250th exhibit, and I did a whole section on the on the water, the well crisis in East Waitley. And it wasn't until Frank Marshawn came and did a talk for that that I realized how much of the bylaws were put in by the people in reaction to that. And all sorts of uses that are prohibited were, were for water protection. And, and all that, there's a sort of miscellaneous section at the end and that's all for water protection. And they, you know, and the, and the same with some of the other things that maybe we don't normally think about. And I just, as I say, I'm as guilty as anyone, but I, it just take a little time and try and think about it, that's all. And, and there are people- I'm happy to stick around. You know, I'm happy to, be on the mailing list and give advice if I can. Sure, I will take you up on that. 
Well, the meeting is not over. Um, there are just a few quick additional items not anticipated. Uh, we got a solar inquiry, and I really, and, and Judy, I do need, this is very much, um, the question had to do with, um, so I'm going to, I won't necessarily be able to share, I'm not going to try to share my screen. But in the solar bylaw, it has a, there's a question about what is in the interpretation of one of the spares. And so, well, meant the to, uh, LS, they just renewables. Yeah, I right, just meant to mark where was the. Well, I just wanted to know where the, what, what was included. Yes, so there was area. She's trying to get the I'm sorry, I'm sorry to slip it around here. Well, I in the solar bylaw, there's there is wording about the two acre minimum, right? And the question was, what does that apply to? I just have to. Get page well, Sarah knows as much about this as I do, but I can say we've never actually formally had to to deal with this. Okay. The exemption we never had situation. Yeah. Um, I think in my mind personally, and I think it was the intent when the bylaw was written that it would include all of the area within the security fence, which is basically. You know the, those they don't make those any bigger than they need to be, obviously for for economic reasons. So that's that's the area you need to to drive equipment around to mow if you're mowing for access for repairs, and it certainly should include all of the equipment, including the transformers and the any of the hardware. Um, I know that town council did not agree with our interpretation of area within the fence for, for the marijuana growing area. But I think there the area was much greater. You know, there was a lot more unused space within that interior. And and obviously it's quite clear clear from the bylaw that that the setbacks start from whatever that that defined point is. That's and the best I can do. Not included in that two acre calculation, which would also yeah. make sense. I mean that's that part is quite clear. It's it's what is the area that that is not um so it might be that town council would say it's only the equipment, but I do think that the maintenance requirements and stuff should be included that's 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 physically part of the operation so so access so you know the roads be, around and the access so the language just says that you know that blah 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 that occupy no more than two acres of land and so i think the question the interpretation what does it mean to occupy right. two acres of land wants and, to get us as many solar panels in as it can in the two acres. Yeah. So it's 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 the solar arrays, it's all the appurtenant structures, right. and that yeah, anything that fits with I would agree with the interpretation, though it's not explicit. Mm -hmm. That's no, so, but that's the that's the intent. Yeah. And it's a practical answer. Yeah. Yeah. The things you have to have to make the facility work. And that we don't burden um, developers by saying the setbacks are included in the, you know, so there's the perimeter and then the perimeter has to be set back mm -hmm. according to the setbacks mm -hmm. and they're not part of the two acres. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you have more than two acres enclosed within this perimeter, then you're exceeding the, mm -hmm. the two acres. Okay, all right. So I can deal with that response. We, we're in agreement there. Um, Pete asked me 
I'll remind everyone that the Franklin Regional Planning Board uh, is this other body. There's a, a, a representative to the FRPB from the Planning Board of all the Franklin towns. I'm currently serving in that capacity. It's it's not a decision making body the way this one is, and it's I plan it's mostly for educational purposes and sharing and and networking. Um, so I'm happy to continue doing that. At some point, I would say so. I'm going to recommend that we all endorse me continuing in this role, and I will let you know. Um, and until I feel like my duties are such that I can't keep this on and I'd like somebody else to step in, but I'm happy to keep with that, right? We're all good with that. No one's yep. dying to get on the FRPB. I'm on um, like the FCCIP. The FCCIP. FCC that's right, who kind of cooperated with Oh, yes, that's true. Yeah. I'm uh, not me for that, so we need four times a year, but we have no authority. Right. But, but you're not a planning board representative, no. you're just at large. Yeah, yeah. I'm a town weekly representative. Okay. Um, I did. Did I circulate the APA guidebook that Pete King got? I, if I haven't, I will. Um, there's a great guidebook that, and I've only just started to look at it, but I will circulate this. It's on our OneDrive. Okay. And I folded it somewhere, but I of course I'll have to tell you where I put it. <laughs> but uh, Judy did a nice job of tipping me off that Pete was a member of APA, which I am not or none of us are. And he had access to this guidebook that's full of useful information. Uh, so I'll circulate that. Just another way of learning more about some of the things that we do here. Um, that's it. Does anyone else have any other items not anticipated? No, I just wanted to publicly thank Judy for all the help she's given me and being a mentor. Judy, you greatly admired and appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you. Anything I can do other than come to meetings. <laughs> okay. Very good. Um, so our next meeting, last topic. Um, at the moment, we have no official business. It's July. Yeah. Um, I'm inclined to take the following position that we will agree we will not meet in July unless something comes up, like if somebody submits a site plan or alerts us that there's some reason for us to meet. Yeah. And we may do an end. But I, I'd kind of like to skip at least the July meeting and then we'll see about the August meeting yeah. as well. Um, just Mr. Monaghan made a point of he was looking for public records request and to request our minutes. Should we have a quick five minute meeting to minutes and that's it? So we have minutes. Oh, so, oh, did he? He made a comment about he wanted a records request in our minutes. Uh, from tonight's meeting and the last one. Well, the, we've just done that. Okay. And that was what we posted. Those will be posted. Right. But he made right. a point about that. We could convene. We have a quorum of people that's in five. I mean, it's so, true. Yeah, I mean, you, you, that are people are you have 60 days. You have 90 days, right? I don't know those. I, I don't know that. You have 90 time. days, I think, to get a meet, get the minutes up. With open meeting law, it's true. We have to be timely. Okay. I'll check it. I, the 30 days is what's stuck in my head, but, but, it, but it may be long. 30 days is a little uh, short for. Well, we've yeah. never we've never met that. <laughs> no, I don't really. I think it's ninety, but okay. okay. Well, maybe that falls under if it gets requested. We'll so let's just out. sort of agree that there's the possibility there will be no meeting sure. in July, sure. or there will be a pro forma meeting with no other business except to approve minutes, that and great. that your everyone's actions is to start thinking about some concrete, like what's your capacity to take on some substantive work? You know, and I feel like I'm willing and able to advise and provide feedback. Now I'm, unlike I think all of you, I'm semi, more or less semi-retired. You know, I teach one course uh, in the academic year but it's not a heavy load, so I have more capacity, but I do have a light, right? <laughs> right? 
Uh, so I'm willing and able to provide more, you know, tips and pointers and all of that. Okay. But it would be great, like if you found your passion and there was a particular topic that you wanted to dig into. Mm -hmm. Um, so think about that. Okay. And that might be something we talk about, if not in August. We said we might have pro forma meetings in July and August with the sort of working understanding that we're really back at work no later than September. So we start the next round of gearing up for yeah. the following town meeting because there are certainly some things that we're going to need to need and want to change in our bylaws and just maybe very simple straightforward. Okay. That sounds good. All right, all of that. I would be happy to hear a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion made, seconded. We are adjourned. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your evening and see you or not in the future and coordinator.